about Paul, so I think it's actually a great segue from what Sam is talking about. And then we're going to wrap up with the model case. Absolutely. We're excited for that. Hi, everybody. I'm Margaret Crook. And um, thank you, Joy, for inviting me. And thank you, Dan, for coming before me, because I do think my talk is going to uh, to uh, reflect a number of the themes that came up in your stories as well, and, and hopefully some new ones as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about quality um, as the sort of missing heart of UHC in many uh, in many countries, uh, perhaps most. Um, with just three points to convey in this talk, uh, first I want to persuade you that quality matters. It's a little bit of a choir situation, so I will just be really quick on that. But then talking about how we might measure it, I think it's a really complicated issue. And, and one of the things we're working on right now is trying to simplify that. And then um, ending with the question of how do we raise our ambition, because I would uh, propose that it's far too low. Uh, so the first um, point is a story that I show often, um, which is just simply that what is the value proposition of a health system? It's quite simple. It's if you come and use our clinics, our, our, our nurses and our doctors, uh, we will provide you with basic evidence-based care. That's the science of medicine. And then you will get better. That's the deal. Um, and then, you know, so I think once you look at universal health coverage in that context of that health system value proposition, you look and see what's emphasized, what elements of coverage are emphasized. Well, you've got the population numbers, right? Who is covered? You have services, what should be inside the cube or inside the benefit package? And there's certainly a lot of appropriate emphasis on financing, because I think it's been one of the missing links in our understanding of, of health uh, care is the incredible ability of healthcare to ruin people and families financially. So important to look at. Uh, but what isn't on anywhere on this list is what's the effectiveness of that care, what's, that, what's the quality of the care that's going to be covered, that's going to be provided more widely, that would be provided to more services. And so where we have been focusing over the last uh, I would say several decades, certainly since the onset of the Millennium Development Goals and, and probably before, um, is very much in the U part of the equation. And the problem with that is that it is not delivering us the results that we would expect. And I can show you dozens and dozens of slides, but here's just one. Um, on the left, you see proportion of women who look at this skill to support their family. On the right, you see the maternal mortality ratio. Now, those two indicators are actually pretty decently linked, or should be, or should be linked, mm -hmm. in that we know the mother of MR is generated in the birth process. That's where it happens. Um, and so when you see just these simple figures, something is wrong. Something is not going right in that skilled birth attending, uh, attendance. And then uh, there was this interesting study recently from the World Health Organization that talked about Okay, it's difficult. Survival can be difficult in low-income country clinics. Why? Well, people are sicker coming in. Many people are sicker. They've had to travel a lot farther. And so let's make sure that we can adjust at the clinic level for the clinical risk that somebody comes in with, right? The, 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 the morbidity <laughs> that, uh, that women in person come in with. And so what they did in a very nice study of about 300 hospitals in 29 countries is they, these are, these are, um, uh, now some categories, low mortality countries, moderate mortality countries, and so on. What you see on the left is um, the model predicted in hospital mortality for delivering mothers. Those are the light bars. And what you see on the right is what actually happens to mothers in those hospitals. So what they're saying is that in hospitals, actually, um, women died at about three times the rate that would have been predicted had they, uh, even adjusting for the fact that they were sicker, um, uh, had they, you know, had they had a mortality that was reasonable for the for the uh, hospital. The um, interesting uh, postscript to this study, and one we're working with our WHO colleagues on reanalyzing, actually, is that uh, the piece to analyze this specific question is that most of those hospitals had no stockouts. Actually, the very best stocked hospitals happened to be in the high mortality countries. They had ready access to maybe and all of those um, elements of care. Uh, that we often uh, point to of being the problem. Yeah, we spoke about it earlier, um, and he's been doing a little bit of analysis on it as well. And uh, the thing is, actually, not, I've got tons of data available. It's just been very much underused uh, to analyze health system function. But I, uh, we put some data together on reasons that families bypass their nearest public facility. 
why don't you go to your local clinic? And this is the head of household. And this was this is for the CD here, but actually this is for um, any time a uh, family member gets sick. So apologies for the label. So families could give multiple reasons. In fact, they gave about um, uh, 500,000 reasons. This is a very large survey uh, for why I had a clean long family. It was a long, long uh, survey. But um, the point here is that about two thirds of the reasons had to do, and that's the purple uh, chunks here, had to do with quality. And only uh, really uh, one third was an issue of, I don't know what a facility is, I don't, I don't know how to get there, it's too far. Um, people knew very well what local facility is. They sussed it out. They just didn't want to go there. Okay? They didn't want to go there because they would have uh, inadequate infrastructure, poor quality of workers. The poor quality was one of the other responses. Um, or they just didn't trust it, the hours were inconvenient, um, and they were made to look at the So we do not have technical and technical quality elements. And then we just talked about this a second ago. I've wondered this question for a very long time. Why is it in the Latin American countries that have introduced universal health coverage, this wonder drug for the population um, that is now going to help them get better and make sure they don't go broke? Why is it in these countries that we've seen such recalcitrant, recalcitrant uh, um, uh, reductions in uh, out of pocket payments? So basically, we've seen a flat line in out of pocket payments in quite the time. But as we just heard, Mexico has spent about 50% of its healthcare dollars through out of pocket spending. That's the most progressive and least efficient uh, approach. And so this always bothered me. Um, how can a population be hurt? For all the important things that matter when 50% of the money is still going from out of pocket, hardly budged. Um, and by comparison with OECD countries, and other OECD countries, Mexico is one now, um, that's you know 20% maybe or 25% double um, what other countries achieve. So one thing I wondered is is this because people are just going for it and not going? Or that doctor is, I like the safety net fishing, uh, selecting the patients in the morning and then actually charging them in the afternoon. Um, that needs more investigation. Okay, so then I think uh, you know quality clearly matters. It matters for outcomes. It matters for spending. Um, and so I looked to see where it featured in the sustainable development goals, since they are meant to be markers of progress for the next 15 years. What are we? How are we to measure whether our systems are providing that core quality that we know we're going to need? So we counted things up, and we see. On the one hand, here are some health outcomes, really important ones. And I should say, some of these are very quality sensitive. They're good markers of high quality health systems. I would argue maternal mortality is one of those. But these are also co produced through many other factors. So they give us a guidance uh, for sure, but maybe imperfect guidance as to what's going on in the health system. Furthermore, as we know, these take a long time to cause. So you could be going down a very, uh, um, uh, you know, a very unproductive path for a long time if you waited for these to change. Tons of markers are still utilization. There really weren't any that were specific to quality. So I'd love to now turn to um, talking about some work that we're doing um, under the aegis of the Lancet Global Health Commission on High Quality Health Systems. Uh, which is a, a commission uh, that I, I am co-leading with Mohamed Pate, former State Minister of Health uh, for, from Nigeria, and uh, 30 incredible commissioners from 18 countries. And the goal of the commission really is to rethink quality, rethink quality as, as the heart of a health system. So that's why the commission is called not Quality of Care, but High Quality Health Systems uh, Commission. And we've been really rethinking everything from the beginning, from, from even the definition of a high quality health system. And that's one I want to share with you. So we have been thinking about high quality health systems as systems that optimize health in a given context, because we know context matters, we've been hearing about that all day, um, by doing three things. Um, consistently delivering care that is really going to off, not just on the lucky day that PIH is there, and can take that woman right in for that surgery, for the evacuation, um, but every day, consistently delivering that care. Being valued and trusted by all people, um, th this is critically important. We were talking about Liberia, uh, and we know that trust had a lot to do with the incredibly slow response to Ebola there. Um, and then finally, responding to changing population needs, because nothing stays the same, but health systems have somehow managed to stay the same for decades. 
even in decades. Still targeting diseases that were largely uh, the problem of the last century still remain and cannot be forgotten, but cannot be the only thing the system is going to be able to look at. All right, and then uh, we've also been rethinking the uh, various frameworks for understanding high quality health systems. And we sort of rearranged and rethought this, uh, the, the building blocks framework that you may be familiar with in WHO and looked at a, just many, many frameworks. I think we identified 30 frameworks. We've been looking at all of them and saying, for one thing, they're very confusing. Some of them are impossible to read. Or, or God forbid, a finance minister would, would you know, drown in the language and the technical wording and the complexity of the causal pathways. So we wanted to keep it really simple. And we, um, first and foremost, by the amount of space on this, on this the mm -hmm. amount of space is meant to signal importance of what to look at. So I can start off with that. We see a lot of real estate dedicated to processes of care and lots of quality impact. And, um, and, and you see these foundations underlying everything. So we see um, high quality health systems as being responsible for two things, largely good care processes that include competent care and user experience, and then of these four types of impacts, um, which also include health, uh, confidence in, in health systems, uh, economic benefits, uh, and then appropriate use of health care, which we know is strongly linked to quality. Um, and then there are these foundations which look more like the traditional sort of building blocks, what needs to be in the system, but we've been thinking hard about those as well. And I'll just propose to you some other ways, or some ways that we're thinking of using the foundations to think about uh, solutions. So let's move on to something about my favorite part. Um, so this is an analysis that we did with colleagues of Joyas and others in um, Haiti. Uh, that looked at a, a very simple question um, using a nationally representative facility survey. So these countries have this incredible wealth, not these countries, several countries, about a dozen countries or so, have done nationally representative facility surveys that are done in a standardized manner across countries, which is very powerful. Not only does it permit us to look at a country's own health system as opposed to one corner of it, you know, over here or over there, but it also permits us to compare countries across. And that obviously is fraught with danger, so we'll talk about that. Let's just look at Haiti. And what we did in Haiti, together with our colleagues uh, in the Ministry of Health there and Partners in Health and uh, um, at Area and Labs here, we uh, did a study led by uh, Anna Dees, one of our researchers on the commission and my group, um, to look at uh, what is the access to care in Haiti. And what we found, for example, was that in terms of timeliness, Right? And the fact that facilities didn't charge user fees, combining those indicators, people had good access. That's this map over here. And actually, um, people-centeredness in terms of a few indicators, they're not wonderful and they're not many, wasn't too bad. Where the entire system fell down was an ineffective care, in the area of effective care. And this was really judged by the processes of care that that facility provided to people. Um, and so this kind of analysis, and also you can show shows you where the problems may be, this kind of geographic analysis. What we did here is we looked at like the facility uh, quality uh, ratings uh, from the survey, and we mapped the population around and we blur the facility edges, so you couldn't tell exactly which clinical of those we can know Haiti very well. Try to keep it slightly confidential uh, for a global audience where this was published, but the Ministry of Health got the precise map with all these facilities. So, um, so just to say that um, access is really not at all the same thing as effective access in Haiti. And so this really prompted us this and other findings over the years. I've worked with lots of different surveys and, uh, that I've done over the years in Sub-Saharan Africa where we're asking people, why do you use dental care but you don't come back to deliver it? And so many of those answers really pointed to the basic lack of trust in the quality that could be provided there. We started to look much more closely at this is a really interesting methodology. This, these data I'm showing you now are based on observations of care. So this is a person um, who's a nurse, typically, in the corner with a checklist with a, with a sheet in which she's quietly checking off all the things that get done in a care visit for a child. Mm -hmm. And the list on the left is what the um, what the WHO recommends a child, you know, with an undifferentiated illness coming into a health center should be asked, or things that should be done to that child, with history. It's a, it's a physical exam and it's you know various tests and, and counseling that need to be given. So that's that's the list. And what we found is looking at 22,000 such observations in eight countries, okay, we see that on average, doctors, nurses, clinical officers, 
uh, are scoring about 34% of the items that the WHO says should be done. Now, you know, you can say, well, that looks like a really long list. Um, so we said, well, what if we brought it down to the bare minimum that we as clinically, some of us clinicians would look at it and say, oh, what's the minimum, minimum that would have to be done? When you do that, you still only get 50% performance. And so things like weighing the child happens in 45% of the business. It's difficult to know how to dose medication if you don't do that. Um, asking about vomiting or diarrhea, you know, in countries with light malnutrition, right, where this complicates so many other illnesses, is done only half the time. Um, you know, counseling on when to return, just a basic obligation of providers, 16% of the time. So these are not empty numbers. These are families that are walking away not knowing when to come back, right? Uh, not knowing um, uh, what the diagnosis is. Only a third of parents will know what the diagnosis might possibly be. Now, I know it's hard to know a diagnosis all the time, but even the effort to speak about a diagnosis of a range of possibilities is only done in one third of the cases. Uh, similarly, you look at um, labor and delivery care, which we talked about earlier, which is where a lot of the maternal mortality can and should be averted. Um, we see similarly uh, some, some parts of, of delivery um, getting done quite routinely. Um, you know, acting HIV status has now become quite routine. This is in two countries, in Kenya and Malawi, they are the only people with labor and delivery observations. Um, taking blood pressure, thank goodness, is relatively common, but not universal, by the way. No. Not universal. Uh, it, it makes me cry when I look at taking a pulse. I mean, yeah. so 60% of the basic, basic obstetric care practices are getting done. Uh, this doesn't even begin to scratch at the emergency care of these women. I mean, they're, they're when they develop complications. So very worrying data. And then you can look at it across nationally, because as I mentioned, the approaches are standardized. And the, really, these are not fancy things that should be done in a standard way across all countries. And so what we did here is we looked at two services across a range of countries that are labeled up, up, uh, up here, and I looked at um, antenatal care and sick child care, um, and was comparing it within country, we're wondering, is one getting done better than the other? And then across countries, uh, what's happening? And you can see a lot of variation, right? Even within countries, some countries have quite wide ranges and what gets done. Um, you see, for example, uh, in, in general, right, the antenatal care has been light, uh, light done, so you probably have a hard time seeing. In general, but not always, the antenatal care um, processes are better. Uh, again, they're, I would argue, easier. In some cases, quite standardized, what you do, right? I mean, it's really preventive care. It's not, you're not responding. But when it comes to curative care and assessment of sick children, we just see terrible results. Many terrible results. And so, really brings us, I'm showing you all observation data. This is a gold standard approach to measuring process quality, actually just watching what gets done and what is it according to evidence, is it based on evidence. Um, but, but actually I would argue that's by far not the most common way to measure quality. The most common way to measure quality is what these slides are going to be showing you, which is what's on the x-axis here. And this is the service readiness measurement. Um, so what is the service readiness um, index? The WHO pro, uh, proposes a service readiness index, which is essentially a combination of about 50 items. So this is equipment, um, staff, and supplies, and medicines that should be in every facility before it's allowed to get there. That's like a basic, you know, supply package, essentially. Um, and we were interested, and this is, by the way, measured in every facility survey, plus, plus many more than 50 items. In fact, we counted about 600 equipment-related items, equipment or medicine, infrastructure-related items on the, um, the service sort of service assessment survey, 600. So just a few of them here on the x-axis. And what's on the y-axis is those clinical observations I was just showing you. We wanted to ask a simple question. If what the world is investing in right now, uh, Sarah surveys, all surveys, are measuring this stuff, uh, literally stuff, um, how good of a predictor is it for clinical care provided in, in those same settings? And this is it right here. So this is sick child care. And what you see here is extremely limited correlation between, uh, between equipment and performance. Um, even where you might argue there is a little bit more of a correlation, when you zoom in on that, literally, what you see, it should be just as a provider, right? It should be just as a provider being watched, giving care in that clinic. Okay? Let's go to the best, best equipped 
clinic in the country with the highest correlation between equipment and performance, you still see massive range of mm -hmm. clinical care in those settings. So, and, and look over here at Malawi. I mean, talking about Malawi, we were hearing from our colleagues in Malawi. I mean, it's it's a nightmare. So you look at this, and you can it's a certain conclusion. That stuff does not make people use it. It does not create evidence-based care. It does not is not sufficient to motivate or encourage providers to do their best or do do what we expect of them. Um, is it essential? Of course. No one here is arguing that it's a critical need for equipment, supplies, and so on. But I do want to caution us to take a step back and ask: When health workers tell us, "I didn't do X because I didn't have Y," is this just buck passing? Really? I, I really I want to challenge that. We've done some analyses that look at only performance on items for which the clinicians had everything in stock, and we see very similar stories. Okay, so it's we just can't take for granted anymore that a stock clinic will be a performing clinic. Um, and so, <laughs> well, it's actually interesting, right? Yeah, you see, the question. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a it's a good point. I mean, you definitely can't get. 100% of the care with 50% of the outputs. But I think the more shocking finding here is that very few clinics of any level of stock are achieving anywhere near what they need to be. Yeah, but absolutely. This is not a, it's not an either or. It's just that the stuff does not predict performance. That's it's far from enough. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about ambition. Because I think, frankly, um, and this is, I think, a, a, a concept that PH would resonate with. We have been failing people all over the world with the incredibly low expectations of what health systems are going to do for them. We've been making ourselves happy by expanding the health workforce and seeing health workers and this and that. And they've been great looking things for politicians. Uh, I think putting clinics in every village or district has been incredibly politically powerful. But it is unclear that these, all of these bits and pieces, these visible uh, elements, are producing um, better care. Um, and I think we need to. Over and so I think the first question that we're asking the clinician is what's in our toolbox for improvement? What do we know about quality improvement? That quality improvement has kind of become like a branded term, QI, right? Mm -hmm. There's lots and lots of branding going on around what is it supposed to involve. And I'll just pull a few systematic reviews. These are systematic reviews of the most common methodologies, some of the most common methodologies that are in our toolbox right now on quality. Um, so quality improvement collaboratives, very hot topic. Um, many of our commissioners are involved in active research in this area. Um, you know, the idea is that uh, people will sit together and, and figure out maybe hospitals or districts um, and figure out best practices and share those, and that sounds great. Uh, but actually, um, very limited evidence. Effects cannot be predicted with certainty. Extremely context specific. Certainly no silver bullet. Um, the PDSA method, very familiar to many people in this room. Um, less than 20% of PDSA studies fully documented the application of a sequence of cycles. The whole point is a sequence of iterative cycles so you can see change, right? Um, and actually, uh, the, the, the changes that these studies demonstrate often is extremely fleeting. Right? Once you stop measuring, it's gone. Um, similarly, with lean interventions, the evidence does not support the enthusiasm on those interventions. Um, so, these are a couple. We specifically wanted to look at another couple of extremely popular QI approaches, which are short trainings. Mm -hmm. Joya, you referred to them <laughs> earlier. Um, and supervision, the, the latest. So, I mean, training's been out for a very, very long time. The supervision's kind of come on board in the last five or ten years. Is that going to fix it all? And I just want to show you, using the same sort of gold standard measure of process quality, which is get seeing what providers do in the real world, <laughs> uh, in real life. Uh, and we looked here in these two regressions. Um, and actually, this is, this is the, this is, uh, you know, their emphasis, startle care. Basically, we looked at um, whether having received training in the past one to two years, whether having received supervisory visits in the past six months, or whether getting both, how much that alters what you are observed to be doing in, in the specific trials. And what you can see here, first of all, for antenatal care, there's almost no effect. I mean, it's significant, the, the thing with the stars. But basically, antenatal, and by the way, this isn't just any training. These surveys are extremely specific. These, these 
you said when you received training on cancer natal care, um, you were supervised by someone in this area. So we see no really nothing going on here. Very small effect size. By the way, the outcome variable has been standardized from zero to 100. So this is sort of you know less, kind of a minimal, minimal gain. Uh, I think less than one item on average more is getting done by those providers for those pregnant women. And then here on sick child care, you see a little bit more association between the training and the position. It just scales one to 100. Yeah. So what we see here, this essentially buys you roughly, when we, when we convert it to the items, clinical items, done, this essentially buys you fewer than two additional clinical items, meaning getting both the course and supervision. You, you do one and a half more things on that list that you know, you're performing 30 or 40% on. Now you do 41% or 42%. Yes, great question. I planted it. Um, so these uh, these regressions, these models are uh, probably overloaded with co covariates. So we have controlled here for everything possible, including the exact equipment that people needed, the it's it, and more, like a provider uh, gender, age, uh, public private clinic. Um, Provider motivation, we had a measure of how motivated. I mean, we, we wanted to really hone in on just these two elements. Um, so I think it's very, very well controlled, probably over controlled. Okay, so then we, when we were working on this paper, we thought this can't be right. <laughs> it must be to do with the quality of the training and the supervision. So what we then did, and we said, well, actually, a survey gives us a lot of information about what was in the training and what was in the supervision. How many items were you supervised on, and what exactly happened? Did you get Back, did somebody review your clinical records? So what you see in the x-axis is the percent of all possible topics that you were trained on, and the percent of all supervisory activities that you could have been supervised on. And you basically do see a slightly positive association, like better training, better supervision. But it's again minuscule. What you see on the y is again we're still not even not even reaching the 50% performance with these, um, with these two incredibly popular interventions that we're spending billions of dollars on. Billions of dollars on. This is all mine. Okay. So we conclude looking at these data and these systematic reviews, um, and on, by the way, incoming evidence on results based financing and all of the limitations of that approach and, and really many other approaches, that we have to think differently about the solution space available for improvement. Um, and for one thing, we have to expand it. We have to expand it beyond the clinic, the individual setting, and think much more about structural, macro, system level changes which unfortunately means we're leaving the land of the quick fixes and the checklists and the silver bullets and really engaging in hard work and actually um, uh, in, in serious questions that are going to leave people uncomfortable. And that's the place we're dwelling right now. Um, so let's look at one particular, one possible approach to fix this point. And that's coming back again to delivery care. Um, we did some analysis that, that uh, looked at um, very, very simple. This is not observations. So that's kind of the school standard measure. We don't have it available for every country. But what we did is we constructed an extremely simple um, index on the y-axis of what we're calling basic maternal care functions. It's still got some inputs in it, um, like essential drugs or delivery. But it's also got, you know, did you do in the last three months these signal functions? So we know that facilities are doing them or not doing them. Um, anyway, it's as good as we could get from many countries. So this is a 12-point index on the, on the y-axis of quality of maternal or basic maternal functions. And here you see how countries are performing in these box plots. You know, um, yeah, uh, some doing better, some doing worse. I was surprised by how poorly Namibia, basically a rich country, <laughs> is doing in some of these um, in some of these clinics. But then we looked further. This is all clinics. We looked further and we assessed um, how might the performance vary based on volume. On the x-axis is delivery volume. And again, the same index I just showed you, the 12 point index is on the y axis. So we um, thought, oh, that's interesting. As you get into the range of 2,000 maybe plus deliveries, you, you know, you, you, and around there, you start to see, you see improvements in what this uh, basic index is looking like. But the biggest find to me was when we went back to our data, and I said, could you, with, with uh, the postdoc who uh, was working with me on this paper, so let's, uh, let's color code the primary care facilities in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. So hospitals simply define a place that has the infection. Okay? Mm -hmm. That is what is red. And blue is primary care. And what we basically, what became clear, it was such a great moment when the data actually just speak to you very clearly. 
clearly, you know, instead of finding like an inflection point on the track, I'm like, ah, oh, I get it. It's the primary care facilities that are underperforming really at all levels of delivery. You see that, you don't see them able to, to really move that quality index up no matter how many births they really have. Um, and whereas the red are sort of almost impervious to the volume uh, issue. So somehow surgical capacity is per, a lot, and that, by the way, none of the indicators on the y-axis have to do with surgery. They're just basic delivery care indicators. Surgical facilities are just doing a much better job um, on that. So let's keep going with this, uh, with this particular story. Uh, and so we, we, we saw these data. I was about to present these data in a, a meeting that we actually hosted in Malawi. We had this keynote, and I thought, how many you understand how to, these countries have all invested in these little facilities? What's, like, what's the story of aspiration as we can tell? And, and how can we help them think about where they are versus maybe um, richer countries that have gone down like that? And so I decided to pull data from rich countries, actually. And what you see here is a proportion of births in these three wealthy countries that are current facilities with fewer than 500 deliveries on the far left of that diagram. Little facilities, essentially. Um, and you can see that all these countries have done every, we all know this, right, have regionalized deliveries. You cannot any longer deliver in your doctor's office or in this primary care clinic you must be close to an obstetrician, a newborn uh, intensive care unit, and so on and so forth. So they have regionalized deliveries and very small percentages of babies, even in very big countries, right, with a lot of rural populations, are delivering in small facilities. By the way, in these countries, all small facilities want to deliver must have C-section, either on-site or fairly close to the When we went back to the data, it's a situation in the highest maternal and newborn mortality countries in the world, right? There, one third of babies are being born in these facilities that I just showed you. you. Can't even deliver on the very basic, basic requirements of delivery care, which is just crazy to me, right? We don't have much maternal mortality, um, and they have all this maternal mortality, and, and all of their um, um, resources are scattered over a massive network of facilities that are underperforming today. And so, maybe this is a generalization. Is this possible of certain services? I'm not talking about every service. In fact, many, many services must stay at the primary care level, very close to people. But some services really do need to have the concentration, talent, skill, volume, and experience. And so we are calling those in the commission quality sensitive services. What are they? Delivery is certainly one of them. As someone who delivered several hundred babies back in my medical career, I know, as many of you do, that uh, emergencies arise all of a sudden with little warning. There is no time to transfer for that woman on those roads that we heard about in Malawi, quite honestly. Uh, we've seen increasing amounts of data coming out saying that actually when women follow the referral pathway, you know, go to your local clinic first and get referred on later, they are much more likely to die. And it's women who ignore that advice and go straight to hospital mm -hmm. that survive. So what we did, and this is again work of some of our very talented team, um, is we just said, let's take Malawi. It's a country we're working in, it's one of the commission countries. A wonderful commissioner from there, um, and he said, what is today's access to delivery facilities? Okay, so DOT is a facility that does deliveries in Malawi. On the books, they have a delivery service, okay? So he said, we found when we did um, an analysis that 95% uh, that of the population is within two hours of a facility. It's a complicated formula because we actually took into account the fact that some women are not living on paved road, so we sort of increased the time they got to clinic. So this is in straight line distance, this is realistic distance. 95% of women today, two hours, within two hours of delivery facility. And said, what if tomorrow, Malawi, right, said no more deliveries uh, outside of hospitals, just hospitals. We just radically closed down all small facilities for delivery. They're still open for all those other services. What we found was that two hour access would reduce, decline barely, actually, Malawi, it would be 94.7%. That doesn't mean that women would travel farther. They obviously would, but the majority, this passenger population, is still within what's considered reasonable by Malawi itself for access. And then what happens to average quality in those, for those women is it goes from 0.6 to 0.8. And so I come back to the examples that Dan gave and others have given. Health is not just a job of the, the local clinic. Health is a job of the system. And moreover, it's the job of the country. And it is just as important, to, maybe just as important, over here, you know, in some of these areas, to build a road to get the woman to the hospital, to contract with a local taxi service, instead of pretending we can offer her good care at the local clinic. I think this ability to pretend and this willful ignorance of the kind of quality that women are seeing at the local level 
really behind this terrible, many of the terrible mm -hmm. elements we're seeing. So this is an intersectoral solution with a lot of political uh, uh, impediments, I would say. Um, because as you all know, as we all know, Robert reminded does, health is very political and yeah. access to services is very political. So what's the conversation that we need to have to make the second reality possible of this economic And then one question that we've also been asking in terms of my decade of research in Sub-Saharan Africa is this observation I was struck from the very beginning that even very poor women are actually quite willing to travel. It's not that we have to pry them all out of their local facility. In a finding region, you know, rural area um, uh, in the center of Tanzania, we see that 43% of women with a documented local delivery facility nearby will ignore that facility and go to a hospital. So by passing rates of quite high where there is a reasonable alternative to what women see near them, the problem is not. Um, let me point to another structural um, change before wrapping up that we're just beginning to investigate. One of the interesting factors that we've been um, considering is the role of pre-service education. Why? Well, when, I'm, when I look, again, putting my, wearing my clinician hat, when I look at the um, clinical observation checklist, you know, people in the corner watching watching the procedures, that reminds me of medical school. It's like an, you know, it's like an OSCE, right? Where you're actually being observed, providing care. I'm like, oh, well, why don't we think of these survey uh, items as exams of people in the field. So what this chart shows you is if we just select people who are recent graduates, so this is people in the first three years of their training, what do we see? How do we see their performance? And could we consider these survey uh, tools essentially as, as in the field exams of their competence? And here's what we're seeing. So again, on average, and by the way, if you're asking me what is, what's the care they're giving here, we actually compiled a 10 item index across multiple services that we consider sort of a good medical practice index. Are you able to, are you taking a basic element of history? Are you doing basic physical exam appropriate to that patient? So this is sort of a combined uh, approach. And what we see is that um, one of the startling findings was advanced practice nurses doing way better than doctors, like substantially better across these countries. And when we start talking with doctors about this, they say to me, my colleagues in Ethiopia were the ones who alerted me to this, they said, well, that makes sense because we're not, we're trained on pathology. We're not actually trained on to assess a patient. That's not how we are trained. Yeah, so they have stepped in, you know, 19th century maybe, 20th century, 20th century model of, of, of medical training that's not getting them in a you know, place right now where they can really assess and do a differential diagnosis of a much more complex set of diseases than ever before. Um, and so one of the next steps of this analysis is to look across countries and see why should Tanzania be 10 points behind Kenya on this exact same index. And that's the sort of discussion that we want to start having. And, and they should be happy to understand the degree of the medical training system. I'm not talking about tools training, this is the actual pre-service training. Um, and so to come back to this framework and, and to wrap up, um, as we really reflect on, on the data and uh, that are coming in and our sort of systematic assessment across a range of conditions, I'm only showing you a few here today, um, we are really realizing that what we need to do in terms of measurement is to focus up here on the processes of care to really understand whether the care is meeting a minimum standard um, inside, that pro inside that clinic with that uh, provider. Uh, and that includes both the user experience, which we know is valuable uh, as instrumental to better health, but also as a right in itself, um, and then also the quality of impact. And then, though, paradoxically almost, where we are sh probably should be looking for improvement, is down here, at the basic foundations of care. Issues like accountability, why are health systems unaccountable to the population today? Um, and what policies and financing tools are available to us? What are the right settings for different kinds of conditions? Thinking about service delivery models and other, um, other approaches. And how can we work with the population actually to raise their expectations of care? Because although in Mexico, they may well understand that this care is crappy. There are other countries that people are extremely poor and have never actually experienced what a good health system can offer. And actually, their uh, expectations are a uh, dampened. Uh, so working with them to demand better services is a big part of the equation, we think. Um, and then finally, to come back to UAC, I will again say there's almost no mention of quality in UAC, where there is mention of sort of gratuitous add-on. Um, and yet, to my mind, uh, we ignore it at our peril. Because you would see how quality is universal coverage, but it's not going to bring health. Um, and it's certainly not going to be used. Some clinics go lower out of pocket to um, And so we need some sort of measure, right, that combines use 
like looks at financing, but also really looks at quality. This is a paper that um, just come out on from our team. Where we said, look, if you just looked at access to three primary care services in, 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 our, in these countries, um, things might look great. Once you multiply that by what actually happens inside the clinic, your coverage doesn't look so awesome anymore. And that's the much more honest picture that's actually impacting people's health, their trust, and their desire to come back to that system. Thanks. People are going to fall away when they stop seeing results or don't see results. Yeah, I am. So the answer to that is we are going to, the, the, the way to impact policy, I think, is to have this conversation with policymakers from the beginning. So in the commission, about half the commissioners are actually policymakers. We specifically didn't stack it with QI experts or quality experts. or We want people who care about whether the health system improves health. That, that was a fundamental requirement and the ability to make change. So we have actually senior officials from a number of ministries of health who are in this analysis with us following this on, on our um, base camp, on, in our meetings, and having the conversations on the phone. Um, Sanam Rodriguez, one of our senior researchers is here. You know, she's on the phone with, with her group in the next couple of days talking about, what do you guys think about the limitations of traditional QI? What do we need to do differently? And, and we're challenging each other in that setting, right? These are not comfortable facts, as I started off by saying. So countries really have to be part of the conversation from the beginning. And we're hoping that those countries then become thought leaders in this area and through their example um, uh, push forward. It's it's a hard set of things we're advocating, right? Look again at your facility education. Look at the way your services are being provided. Be serious about what you report to people about quality. Um, so we, we need those early adopters and that's our, that's our strategy. Yeah. 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 yeah, so we've been working, I was at the World Bank uh, last week, um, this is an ongoing conversation with them, and the reason I point to the World Bank is because they're sitting at a treasure store of actually the data that they have not yet published, I've been, I've been agitating about this for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. With results, actually, with results from their RBF studies, which were carefully designed, right? RCTs, many of them, not all, but many. Um, and the and I think you know where we stand today, just on the published data, the the, the 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 good studies, is that you get essentially what you pay for. So or that you get uh, well, you get a subset of what you pay for. In an RBF setting, what you typically get is you get the easiest to do indicators, right? The things that require more cognitive effort, more effort of any sort are the ones that move the least. So you get to improve tetanus toxoid because it's easy to give, it's a one-off, and so on. You also get increased utilization. That's a consistent finding from all the studies. And, and I think health workers have become very imaginative if that's one of the things they're compensated on in terms of working with CHWs. We've seen lots of studies of them trying to bring people in. That's actually easy to do. One thing I haven't mentioned in this um, presentation, but I mentioned frequently, is we've solved utilization. Like, we really do know how to bring people to the clinic. Um, we should be shifting uh, the deeper problem of what happens in the clinic. But anyway, they, we can improve utilization through RBF and through 100,000 other ways, um, and we can improve the, the easy to do things is what we've learned. What's harder to know, there's very little effect in non-targeted services. So one of the things we're thinking about in the commission is 
you're essentially, you're, you're, you're basically keeping the cap. People are performing those individuals are paid, and nothing fundamentally is shifting with our concern. And we see this in education and in other areas as well. As you know, we have very lackluster results in RBF and high number of right, as mm -hmm. well. So it's just, it is definitely, I mean, is it going to be useful in some places? Probably, or, you know. Um, it would an increased salary with greater accountability be equally useful? Possibly. Mm -hmm. But we've never tested the means that we're assuming people are going to jump to these incentives. So I think uh, the jury's out on the final impact, but it is not going to be moving things from point three four to, to doubling that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In fact, we, this is a call to you, Rob, but also to everybody in this room. We really want great systematic examples. I think the horror stories are, are something, for sure. And, and I think sometimes they can move real lasting change, and sometimes they just, you know, do a public, a single public press conference and, and, and little follows. We are very interested in accountability mechanisms that um, with teeth, right? Because we absolutely agree that actually a lot of what you're seeing from the health workers is they've just they're just doing the bare minimum. They are not feeling accountable uh, and, and don't have any consequences actually uh, for their work. By the way, I did mention in some of these regressions, we actually looked at whether there are QI activities and complaint boxes. It doesn't matter if you have QI activity complaint boxes if none of that ever turns around and invites anyone in for, for, for misuse. Yeah. So, I think that um, when you furnish a hospital with, and these are two things, we've been thinking hard about this, of course. Um, a, a, a facility with an operating room, right, has by definition clinicians, means medical officers generally. I mean, some countries, non physicians are also able to do these things. But I think with that comes a, a, a sense of this serious stuff here. Yeah, higher, absolutely, higher ambition, higher, a, a different culture of quality. There is a, a, you know, hygiene is, is more important. I just think we're elevating the game of these facilities. Delivery is taken much more seriously. Those are my personal, you know, we, we can, these data don't give us that level of resolution. I'd love to be able to comment more. But I just think it changes the way that delivery is viewed, what happens to, to women when they come. Because I think we, we Again, people have acute disservice in thinking that some of these um, some of these conditions are, are basic and primary and can be managed by just about anyone. I think that's that's completely wrong. Yeah. And I think these facilities uh, they look at them very differently. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Great, great question. I'll start with that one. I think that's a huge area for, for new work. You know, there was a there was a commission on medical education just a few years ago that our mm -hmm. former dean Cindy Frank and others led, identified all of these deficiencies and the, the rigid structures, the, the fact-based sort of education as opposed to um, problem-based um, education. Um, so I, I think that's I'm, I'm not a medical education expert. It's just interesting how many directions this work has taken us. I'm like, oh my gosh, we don't know anything about medical education. We could, I mean, I've been educated medically, but you know what I mean. I don't know how to design it or what works. Um, so I think uh, that is where we hope to collaborate with others, where we can develop novel approaches that, that also have, you know, we're getting a lot of really exciting insights from our commission, like this is a Malawi colleague who came out said, and often this over even a lunch or a drink, they'll say, you know, we have to double our health workers. We know they have no experience in getting into the care plan they graduate. There's just no, there's no room. There's no room to supervise that. There's no room to, to really provide the quality of care that we need. So a lot more ideas needed there. And then, oh, HMI systems, great question. We have another slide, which I did not want to go through. We're working on a bunch of different fronts, including measurement. For sure, real-time data are very valuable. Um, and what we are seeing interestingly is that in the lower income countries, HMIS um, uh, uh, systems are focused more on kind of inputs and very basic processes like how many antenatal care visits this woman have. And when we move to places like Mexico, we analyze their HMIS, we see much more emphasis on processes and outcomes of care. So it's actually, we see the same sort of intense interest in, in inputs in low income countries. Uh, as kind of overwhelming even the HMIS system you know, in a way, uh, and access focus, right? Uh, so many HMIS indicators on access alone. But that's just Don't we need to report on what we did to those people in another area? So that's another, so we are definitely making some recommendations on the use of HMIS. Yeah. Um, so your first question is Projects that one of the studies where we're training to move forward to building the function of the supervisor. We questions in the things we found was when we were coming up with our quarterly reports, a couple times we actually sat with the actual management and front line providers. And they were really helpful and enlightening. Some of the questions that we had on our checklist were actually not very novel. We were kind of asking the wrong questions. So we started bringing them more and more into the system, involving you know, not just you know, the patient population, or even the health population that we have to provide, allow us to make a better tool. So I just want to ask is this um, you know, primary voice involved? Is that something that uh, um, quality focus? All right, no, good answer. Um, you know, it's a tough one. I'm going to be honest with you. I think that um, these are things that there is a relatively systematic way to assess this. We, we know there's heterogeneity in how a child presents. I mean, I'm fully sympathetic. And I also know there's obviously limitations of what someone can do. And actually, some systems are designed differently, right? Like a child's weight is done before the visit. You know, so, so the tool has to be responsive to context. But I do think that, in a way, our alliance with health workers and our system-facing kind of approach to improvement, where we sit with them in a group, and I've done this myself. You know, we just finished a five-year NIH study, five years in which we adopted all the all the kind of evidence-based approaches for quality improvement from the HIV world to maternal care, and we've gotten you know, literally with no results. And it's reported to the NIH we have not been able to prove quality. And when I sit with health workers, they they're sort of you know, it's not it's not our fault. We didn't have the thing, and you need to adjust how you measure. It's incredible, and I, I just think that it, it, yes, we have to listen to health workers, and yes, they are stressed and underpaid. And I'm very sympathetic, you know, to many of the situations that we see. At the same time, when you look at the sort of data from the World Bank, the average number of visits per coming health worker is seven a day, right? And in Uganda, it's six. And I think again, we ignore those facts because we're so sympathetic and we're so so I guess what I would just say, stepping back, is we need health systems, high quality health systems, to be people facing. They are held up to people, frankly, not the health worker, which is a way to get there to the better health. 
And if we continue to focus on health worker generated solutions only, when I think that's where we've been, a lot of us, and those of us work intensely in these settings, and I think you guys do as well. Yes, we can get some ideas, but we will never get the full picture because it, it resides at it, problems reside, the roots reside at a different level. Thank you.